You don't have a cold one, do you? Please join me in our prayer of illumination. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, fed the hungry with the bread of his life and the word of his kingdom. Renew your people with your heavenly grace. Sustain us with your true and living bread, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'm going to change the scripture just a tad. It's actually John 6, 35. Through 51, 35 through 51. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me, and you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up in the last day. Then the Jews began to complain about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. Not, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the man of in the wilderness, and he died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will be lived forever, and the bread that I will give for my little life of the world is my flesh. All that I am. Have you ever noticed that it's very difficult to escape, escape your reputation? Once people have an image of you in their minds, it's very difficult to change the perception. There's a whole class of, of uh, people that graduated from Augusta, South, Augusta at that time, high school, in the year of 1958, who still can't believe the Ron Cox and Pastor. I guarantee it. I went back here before, and the, and the, the relationship it all changed. Ronnie, you got to be kidding me. Back in the 1940s, a hot, very highly popular advertising jingle for Chiquita Bananas ended with the line. How many of you remember the Chiquita Banana little jingle? You dated yourself, just so you know. I can't sing it. This is the last one. Bananas like the climate of the very, very tropical equator, so you should never put bananas in the refrigerator. No, no, no. That was the last one. We're told that the only reason the word refrigerator was mentioned in the jingle was that it rhymed with the equator. The company wanted shoppers to be reminded that the bananas came all the way from Central America, which was a big deal. The truth was and is that bananas can be put in the refrigerator. Yes, yes, yes. And actually last longer if they are kept in the refrigerator. All because of the jingle and the word didn't change. However, that didn't matter in the, 40, in the 40s when the refrigerators were tiny and the majority of women who went to the grocery shopping, they went out shopping almost daily. What mattered then was that the people loved the Chiquita Bananas jingle, sang it everywhere and bought a lot of bananas. The jingle became so popular, according to uh, that appeared even in the jukebox. I remember that. And the U.S. government borrowed the tune for the song about conserving water during World War II, the Chiquita Bananas song. You remember the lady? She had a big thing on. However, what seemed to be perfect ad campaign began costing the company sales in the 50s when the suburbs boomed, refrigerators doubled in size, and shopping became a once a week event. 
Shoppers would buy a dozen apples or a dozen oranges, but only three bananas because they knew that bananas should never go in the refrigerator and spoil. The company tried in vain for years to counter the jingles message, but finally they just gave up. Once people had certain enemies in their minds, they did not give up doing it very easily. This story today, Jesus ran into the same thing. He lived in a small town in a small country. People knew his mother and father. They may have even known him in his role as a carpenter. Perhaps he had built a piece of furniture with them, or replaced a handle on their favorite tools, or fixed a roof. After all, but whatever, he didn't begin his ministry until he was 30. For most of his adult life, he worked in a carpenter shop as a carpenter. Can you imagine how people responded when suddenly he proclaimed himself to be the one prophesied by the prophets? Suddenly, the day came, he said, this is who I am? We read in today's lesson that his fellow countrymen began to grumble about Jesus because he said that he was the bread that came down from heaven. This can't be. This is, this is, the, this is the, his folks down the road. He worked on my room. He said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, who was the father, mother and father we know? We can appreciate this disbelief, but we've done the same thing to people ourselves. We put them in a box. We assign them to a category. We do it all the time. We know where they came from. We know who their parents are. We know where they came went to school. We can, we can tell by their accent or by their appearance, by their background, and we make assumptions because of that. Because we make those assumptions, we treat them in a certain way. Maybe for a teacher, we suddenly overlook them in class. For a police officer, perhaps we're a little more aggressive when we pull them over to the curb. If we're the president of a company, perhaps it slants the way we regard them when it comes time for promotion. I mean, I don't know. None of this is intentional. Most of it is not intentional, but some of it is. Of course. We may not even be conscious of it. It simply saves our brains the time and the energy of sorting out people individually. So we sort them out categorically. I know who you are. You're Mary Joseph's son. You're from Nazareth. That's that's farming back there, I think, and people are a little slow down there. That's the way human brains operate, folks. Like it or not. So be careful when you, you judge another person's potential just by what you see or hear. Anytime you write anyone off without giving them a fair shot, you'll make a mistake. Robert Sewer once asked one of his colleagues, this question. He says, what, are one of the, what is one of the most vivid memories you have of going to school as a child? Here's what he called and told him. In the third grade, we were asked to stand up in front of the class and say what we wanted to be when we grew up. Now, I went to a fairly strict school, and every time we were asked to stand before the class, it was a pretty serious matter. I remember how there was very distinctly one girl who stood up and said, I'm going to be a movie star. As I remember, there wasn't anything special about this girl. She wasn't very pretty. Her grades were average. Some of them were even below average. She didn't come from a wealthy family. In fact, the only thing I really remember about her was the class laughing at her. The whole class laughed at her. I remember she just stood there smiling as if she knew something the rest of us didn't. I don't ever remember seeing that girl again in school. Now I see her all the time. She's one of the biggest movie stars in Hollywood. Every time I sit in the movie theater and watch her up on up there on the silver screen, I think she was always so proud of who she was. She had a dream she always held on to. Back then, he concluded, they laughed at her. Now they pay to see her. I'm glad I didn't laugh. They laughed at Jesus, too, folks. Pray for him. You gotta be kidding. We know where he came from. Mary and Joseph's son, folks. Be careful. Be careful when you judge anyone else's potential. Be especially careful when you place them in a, people in a box because they use belongs to a particular group or 
or have an accent or, a, or whatever. Long hair, short hair, gray hair, no hair. Be careful of no hair. Minorities, ethnics, you have these exos. There are so many factors that determine a person's success in life. Intelligence, talent, determination, desire. Exonal characteristics are perhaps a very fine, tiny portion of the equation. Example, people put Elizabeth Blackwell in a box. Some of you may come in and about Elizabeth Blackwell. The box was labeled a woman. Elizabeth had a dream. Back when dreams for women were very circumscribed. Society thought that dreams were fine things, except when helping women. It's hard for us to remember this attitude today, but it was real then. But Elizabeth Blackwell had too much gumption to care what society thought. So she set out to realize her dream of becoming a doctor. She applied to eight medical schools and rejected outright. And the only reason could have been she was a woman. But one school, Geneva Medical School in New York, finally accepted her. Elizabeth, however, didn't know that the professors had admitted her because they thought it would be great fun to watch a woman struggle and fail at learning. After consulting the other students, they agreed to admit her just as a joke. But only Elizabeth was laughing when she graduated at the head of the class. She traveled to Europe and studied at the finest medical schools there. But on her return to the United States, she couldn't get a minute of medical practice anywhere. So they rejected because she was a woman. So Elizabeth set out on her own clinic in the slums of neighborhoods of New York City. In spite of the frequent harassment, she kept the clinic going somehow, caring for the poor, immigrant, people at the bottom of society. When the Civil War broke out, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell began training nurses for the battlefield. Bring scores of women nurses to send them to the front lines and nurse the wounded and even the many times to save a lot. By the end of the war, women nurses were an institution in American society. No one gave them a second thought. Dr. Blackwell's legions of women nurses had gained the social acceptance that she had worked so hard to earn for herself. And in 1868, she was able to open a medical school for women. She spent her last years in London training women nurses and women doctors. Thanks to her efforts, barriers of prejudice came down and women became accepted members in the field of medicine. Probably nobody here that hasn't been a woman doctor. Many years ago in that time, you would have never been a woman doctor. That story can be told over and over again in all areas of life, sadly enough. We do a great people a great disservice and we limit what they might offer to society when we prejudge them by their gender or their color or their accent or any other service characteristics. But we continue to do it all the time. I find myself doing it sometimes. For instance, you get that angry call on the phone and the, the voice is falling. You immediately make assumptions. Don't you? Makes no difference where we come from, or how we look, or talk, or who our parents are. We are all children of God. We all have more potential than we can ever exhaust. More than all of us can ever imagine. There is one who can help us to orient our lives that we can overcome every obstacle. It's Christ. The bread of life. When we feed on Him, we find we're able to accomplish more than we ever dreamed possible. All of us. Final story. Tracy Bailey stood before the judge with his head held high. His jaw set defiantly against the sentence the judge was about to pronounce. The words of his high school wrestling coach echoed in his mind. Don't you ever hang your head. Never admit defeat. Tracy wouldn't hang his head. Not before his ashamed and heartbroken parents, 
not before his shock community, not before his judge, and certainly not before God. No one will see his pain. The citizens of Goshen, Indiana, have been stunned to learn that Tracy Bailey, captain of the wrestling team, member of the student council, good student from a church going Bailey family, had been one of the teens involved in devastating vandalism attack on a local high school. Vandalism. Keep that in mind. He had fallen in with the wrong crowd, he used alcohol to fuel their frequent battle, petty vandalism, and thefts. One night, the boys in a drunken frenzy had broken into the high school and torn apart the whole classroom. Vandalism. Now the judge wanted to hold them up as an example. Tracy was sentenced, folks, to five years. Five years in the juvenile offenders itself. Originally conceived as a lesser form of penitentiary, this facility now held hardened criminals, even murderers, and rapists. This was no place for a young man to be. In prison, Tracy was determined not to bend an inch. He would be tough. And he was tough. He would never be, no matter how much he was hurt, he would never, ever be. But during a stint in solitary confinement, Tracy happened to catch sight of himself in a mirror. And the sight shocked him. He didn't look just hard on him. Dead was more like him. And he knew that the deadness would keep reaching down into his very soul. All of his toughness melted away. Tears began to flow as he prayed to God and admitted his defeat. There was no one else to turn to. And he couldn't rely on his own reserves anymore. Because he didn't know how long he prayed. But he does know that God heard him. One of his guards approached him and prayed with him. Someone else gave him a Gideon Bible and soon he joined the prison Bible study. When he was released earlier from the center, Tracy worked for a few months to pay off his debts and make restitution to the school and evangelize. Then he entered college studying for an education degree in science and math. He decided that he would pay back society by becoming a good role model for other confused young people. So he decided to become a teacher. Uh, I guess you can say he reached his goal. In April of 1993, Tracy Bailey attended a special ceremony at the White House where the President of the United States awarded him the National Teacher of the Year honors. He made it. What's your degree? No. Just because you're slightly hair headed, maybe, or whatever, you know, any of that stuff that I've talked about. It doesn't matter. Don't tell me what you have against you. Too short, I've heard that all my life. Too tall, too old, I hear that often. Too female, or I'm female, or I'm Hispanic, or I didn't go to a very good school. My parents didn't have money to give me all the advantages. Don't tell me about the obstacles you have to overcome, or God is able to overcome any obstacle. Don't tell me where you came from. It doesn't matter. All that matters is where you're going. Who's going with you? So that changes everything. If the man on the tiny town of Nazareth is with you, the man who spent most of his adult life as a carpenter shop, the man who was laughed at because he knew his father and mother, he knew his father and mother, the man who now runs with the Father in glory, if that man is going with you, then hold on for the great adventure. Wrong way. Make certain that you do not make the same mistake that others make. The mistake of judging people on the basis of outward characteristics that have nothing to do with what's in their heart and who they really are. I thank God that He touched my life and changed my life and enabled me to be a pastor of all things. Not because a pastor. Thank you, Father, for always being there with us and for us. You just change everything in our lives and make us whole. 
Give us direction, strength, purpose. All the things we so much need in our lives. And perhaps most of all, the time in our life, give us peace.